Mm. Let's see. Yep. All right. Perfect. I think the sounds on. Yeah. Just adjust our microphone here a bit. Uh, oh, I'm really cut off there. Let me move. Hold on a second. That's a little bit better. I, like cut off the top of my head too much there. It's hard to like fit myself, and I want the table to be seen in the flight like, camera here. Uh, I wish this was just like a little bit higher. Like if it was right there. So you could see it, it'd be great. But now it's kind of like just, just barely visible. But um, I don't really. This is just literally just a folding table. Uh, one of the one of those folding like uh little desk things sitting on top of a storage container or one of those plastic bins for like big plastic storage bins. So it's uh not exactly the not exactly the best setup. But you know, it's what works. Uh let's see where were we? Lecture six. We are on lecture seven. Alright, uh hello. I am back again for another exciting stream of reading Foucault's lectures on the will to know you know as i've been said it multiple times i started off each, each start off each stream with this um i wanted to read this book and i figured why not do a live stream of me reading it out loud because why not and also studying so i got a notebook here just off camera the computer I, the computer i stream as over there so i just look over there for some reason um Yeah, uh, so I'm going to take some notes, maybe, if there's anything interesting. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get into it. Um, Any channel stuff? I always like to start off this channel updates, I guess, just in the beginning. Um, probably another CCRU writing or CCRU essay audiobook tomorrow. Um, I've recorded, so on the CCRU website, there is... An archive page that has all well I guess not really all but a lot of their writings and I've been making audiobooks of those and so I finished today or yesterday I finished recording all of them so now I just have to edit them but like there's like three or four left and so now I just have to edit them and listen to them through one more time to make sure everything is good and then they'll be all ready to be uploaded probably once a week just to stretch them out a bit um so yeah then after that i guess there's another uh section of ccru writings uh the swarm there's like i think there's like a little journal or like pamphlets they made um called swarm machines i think or swarm and there's like four issues of that i guess um i know one was distributed at i think their syzygy conference or a conference or not conference um art show they did like a couple art shows and one of them i think was distributed for that and it has a lot of their famous or i guess not famous but a lot of the um essays they wrote that made it into the ccru book so like um Barker Speaks, I think, is in there, and uh, mm, what else was in there? I think the Maximilian Crab stuff, and like, you know, like a lot of like Lemurian, not, not Lemurian Time War, that was um, Ply, I think. Plea? Ply? I don't remember which it was. Um, which is like a philosophy journal, they published that. No, no, they published, wait, they published Flatlines in the philosophy journal. I think Lemurian Time War is in swarm machines i can't remember hmm i went at like one point to find out like where because the writings are on the website were actually published in other places like other journals or magazines or like um they did art shows like i said 
and they were published for that. And I went through like once and tried to find where they are, where they were originally published. And, uh, I can't really remember where they all were, you know, cause I obviously don't like to memorize that, but so I think I'm working work on the swarm part and work through those, probably not all of them because I've already recorded some of them for C most of them, hopefully for CCRU, but there's a bunch not by like Nick Land or the CCRU label, but by some other people um, wrote for that. But anyways, so that's what I guess the next sex set of audio books I would be making. And then probably, I think that's all like actual like under the CCRU name or brand, I guess, um, left. So then it'd be like moving on to, I guess, Fang Numina or something by Mark Fisher, I guess. But I th I'm thinking of doing a Mark Fisher book after I finish this one. I was thinking of reading his, I think his disser dissertation called Flatline Constructs. I was thinking of reading that because I would like to get into the kind of more philosophy set parts of CCRU, at least maybe for like the, I would, for like this stuff just because um the fiction side of ccre is pretty neat but i would like to get into like kind of more th theory but um oh we just lost a bunch of frames that's weird oh well i guess i got choppy there for a minute anyway so enough of that that's all i need to say about that let us get in to mark not mark fisher but michelle foucault's Lectures on the Will to Know. And we are on lecture number seven. Lecture number seven, February 10th, 1971. And we've been talking about the Greeks and sort of the system, I guess, of like justice and knowledge and how it's developed and in ancient Greece. And, uh, so he's just kind of going from like the ancient epic poems and like myth mythological, I guess, side, like ancient prehistory, and now moving into like the classical ancient Greek or the stuff right before the classical ancient Greek, I guess. I don't know. I don't know the timeline of Greece that well. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Uh, the texts from Hesiod in the late in the later Gorton legislation have revealed a const have revealed a contrast between two types of juridical action, Crinian and Dicazine. And I should say that I don't know how to pronounce any Greek words, so I know that that's probably one that's very likely wrong. But just bear with me with that. Uh, the formal construct. The formal contrast, in one case, the two parties swear an oath. In the other, the judge, too, utters the ritual formula of the oath and imprecation. And the contrast in the way the sentence is arrived at, in one case, through the mechanism of oaths. In the other, by decision, the judge, who is not bound by the oaths of the parties. From one judicial practice to the other, the entire distribution of the war, the entire distribution of the word of truth changes. A. In Dicazine, it is uttered by the litigants. Far from the, far from the necessarily contradictory character of these, two, of these two assertions of truth, creating a problem and invalidating both of them, it is, their, it is their conflict that, in the form of the symbolic struggle of the Aegon, carries a day. The weightiest imprecation necessarily triumphs. The sentence is not arrived at above the, op above the opposing discourses. It is brought about in and through the game of their opposition. The, ju the judge does not weigh the value of proofs measured with complete neutrality by a third and indifferent opinion, but the weight of uttered assertions in the game of the real clash. B. In Crinian, on the other hand, the word of truth is shifted from the litigant to the judge. We are to believe the ritual formula 
of the amph Amphictyons. Of the Amphictyons. No. It is for the judge to tell the truth, and if it does not and if he does not do so, to expose himself to the vengeance of the gods. He takes in the ordeal form of the truth, test and torture test and torture on his own account. As a result, the party's oaths tend to play no more than a declarative role. The two litigants declare <clears throat> the two litigants declare Oh wait. Sorry, I lost my plate. There we go. The two litigants declare that they are instituting proceedings, that they leave it up to the judge, that they declare in this way what their argument is, and then the role of the judge's sentence will be to say which is true, or more true, or better. The real opposition of two discourses is no longer to be resolved by its own dynamic. A third instance is to choose between them and say which is more valid. The truth is what is said of one or the other from a point which is not that of either of them. But a problem arises when the judge exposes himself by swearing on oath. What criterion does he use for the case in which a sentence is not good? In the name of what, in the name of what does he make the division? To what rule is this third discourse subject in order to arrive at his decision? I'm going to get a drink of water real quick. Thirsty today. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> um, A. Section A. The appearance of Dikion. And what must the judges were be modeled in Crinian? It is not the set of existing laws, as is proved by provisions which can be found in the Gorton Law, or which can infer from it. Crinian comes into play where law is lacking, tradition is silent, and the role assigned to the litigant can no longer be properly fulfilled. In many, it may be that this, it may be that this is in cases of interfamily disputes, where the tradition is not well established. It may also be that Crinian comes into play when it is a matter of assessing an injury, a good, or a share. In short, it is legitimate to suppose that the use of Crinian is linked to the development of a society in which there are increasingly extensive economic relationships which extend beyond the family framework. In any case, what guides a judge's sentences in Crinian, what he is bound to by his oath, is not the law, Thesmos, but something else. It is what is that it is what is designated by the term dikion. The notion of the the notion and the word do not exist in Homer. Dike appears in the Iliad and the Odyssey, five times in the Iliad, more often in the Odyssey, but with the meaning of verdict or, but with the meaning of verdict or sentence, exercise of justice, legal or lawful procedure, an action initiated, a complaint formulated according to the rules. Right and prerogative, of, right and right and prerogative of each, lawfulness of actions and sentences. So, in sum, DK is what is at stake in the procedure, the procedure, the procedure itself, and its compliance with the rules, the sentence, and what results from it. DK is not what governs judicial action, but rather is deplo its deployment, its game, and what is at stake in this game. What governs DK is thesmos, i.e. custom, law, and rule. Section B, Hesiod's Dikion. In Hesiod, on the other hand, the term Dikion appears linked to DK as its correlative. It, this correlation, DK, Dikion, appears quite clearly in the passages, in the passage in works and days, devote to the happiness and misfortune of the city. A whole series of misfortunes will ensure will ensue if kings do not deliver justice according to the principle of Dikion. What are these misfortunes and how are they distributed? A. As regards the as regards the actual nature of the misfortunes, they are the same as those that strike perjurers according to the old Homeric and traditional formulae of imprecation, the death of individuals 
the sterility of women, cattle and crops, war and disasters. B, on the other hand, the distribution of these traditional misfortunes changes. In the sacramental formula, it is a perjurer himself who pays, or his descendants and race. The vengeance of Zeus, guarantee of oaths, follows the same lines as human retributions. Blood, genos, race to find the limits, the privileged points of application, the lines of communication of punishments. In Hesiod, the whole town is a victim of the injustice of its kings. Family kinship does not indicate in advance the possible victims. The state or the city envelops them all. The state or the city envelops them all without distinction. C. But the theology of this punishment is also partially modified. In Homer, when there is perjury, Zeus, his sovereignty having been scorned, his sovereignty having been scorned, took revenge directly, even if he happened to delay the day of settlement. In Hesiod, when kings do not judge well, Dike serves as, in Dike serves as an intermediary. It is Dike who is offended, who leaves earth and, taking refuge on Zeus's lap, requests his vengeance. First of all, bad judgments provoke the absence of Dike, and then secondarily, the insult to D.K. provokes the anger of Zeus. The discourse and practice of justice no longer deal directly with Zeus, who sends decrees, guarantees oaths, and punishes perjurers. They come into contact with him through the intermediary of D.K., a strange goddess, the correlative of human practices, since their bad judgments drive her away. But because she is absent, Bad judgments multiply. D. But even more than this different theological causality, a whole new system of correlations is set up. The new system has a number of characteristics. A whole set of economic conducts, like dishonest purchases, fraud on goods, are assimilated to perjury, false oaths, crooked sentences, and impiety. It is as if Hesiod was calling for the same sacred guarantees around transactions as around judicial oaths. It is as if he was seeking to give, his, to give this behavior the same judicial religious structure as disputes and litigations. The system involves a new partner who plays an ambiguous role in this game of justice and reward, injustice and punishment. This new element is a neighbor Gaton. On the one hand, the neighbor is a form of abundance, a good harvest, a gift for the gods, a reward offered for piety and observance of the rules. A bad, neighbor, a bad neighbor is a calamity, just as a good neighbor is a real treasure. His lot is good who finds a good neighbor. But on the other hand, the neighbor is a source of retribution. He rewards and enriches. He spreads misfortune. Your cow will not die if you do not, if you do not have a bad neighbor. What you, take, what you take from someone without his consent, heeding only shamelessness, turns his heart to ice against you. If the neighbor is this ambiguous if the neighbor is in this ambiguous position, it is insofar as he is the it is insofar as he is an indispensable element in the system of exchange. Exchange exchange which, as in Homer as in Homeric society, has the form of gift and counter-gift. But here, imbalance, giving more than one has received, is no longer a matter of prestige, but of calculation and measure. Measure exactly what you borrow from your neighbor and give back to him the same in equal measure, and even more if he can, so that, he will be sure his, so that you will be sure of his help in time of need. Justice takes shape in the measured system of services, debts, and the repayment. Instead of exposure to the instead of exposure to the both imminent and indefinite vengeance of Zeus. Finally, this just and measurable order of debt is linked to another, also measurable order, which is that of the seasons, weather, harvest, stars, and days. The relation the relation between the order of neighbor 
the relation between the order of neighborliness and debts, on the one hand, and the order of work and days, on the other, is established to the contrast between begging and subsistence. If you do not give to your neighbor, you will get nothing from him when in need. You will not have what you need to sow at the right moment, hence poverty. If you do not sow, if you do not labor at the right time, you will be reduced, not to the system of measured debt, but to that of demand without compensation, but to, but to that of demand without compensation that is to say, of begging. The order of things, the time of work, favorable seasons, and good days are the kind of elements on which just conduct must base itself. Just as this natural order, in turn, will spontaneously, rewar will spontaneously reward just contact. Just conduct. Happy and fortunate is he who, knowing what concerns the days, does his work without reflection does his work without offending the immortals, following heavenly advice and avoiding all wrong, following heavenly advice and avoiding all wrong. Let's not forget that the relation between Zeus's decree, the regular order of moments, just retribution, and the game of borrowing and debt, repaid without conflict, is formulated in the Theogony. Zeus married the shining equity, who was mother of the hours discipline, justice, and blooming peace, who watch over the fields of mortal men. Finally, the just on which Crinian rests, and which must serve as eminent rule to this practice of justice, is therefore completely different from what governs the old justice of the decisive oath. The latter knew only the formula <clears throat> the latter knew only the formal rule. Now, Crenian must rest on a justice which is, one, linked to the very order of the world, not just to the anger of the gods, two, linked to the time of cycles and restitutions, time of the promised return, return of the debt, and return of the seasons, passage to the same point, and no longer to the more or less delayed imminence of divine vengeance, three, linked to the promise, to the expiry date, the moment when the debt must be repaid. 4. Linked finally to measure, measure of temporal cycles, of the quantity and value of things. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Not exactly the most interesting section here. In the system of challenge, in the system of challenge, truth. Time was a time of the lightning event, the thunderbolt event, which strikes without one being able to avoid it, but at a moment which cannot be predicted, there is no danger of Zeus's vengeance ever failing, but one does not know when it will take place. Moreover, payments, rewards, and retaliations always take the form of imbalance. When Agamemnon makes peace with Achilles, he offers him much more than he had taken from him. In the system of judgment, restitutions are made in the form of balance and measure. <clears throat> and the events take place, must take place, at moments that are well defined in advance, and can be exactly measured. These two systems of measure are not impervious to each other since, as Hesiod says, if one gives back a bit more than the measure, it is so that he will be able to ask again in due course. These four elements in the measure, and of a little more, of the expiry date, and of again, struck or dikion, which constitutes the imminent rule of Crinian. We can see that we can see the underlying we can see that underlying the appearance of dikion is a whole new set of economic relationships which call for it, 
and make it possible. Peasant debt, with what this implies regarding the separation of genos and collective property, the form the formation of a small individual property overpopulate overpopulation also in the absence of money and standard of measure. Works and days, poem of this peasant debt. Poem of this peasant debt, which return which the return of the seasons and fixed times pay off or renews, and which measures in the absence of money make uncertain. The calendar and the measure, the cycle of time and the monetary symbol is what is required by peasant debt. And it is on this that cranium must be structured. All right, I like that interesting. Structured on debt. So like now debt is becoming a sort of foundation of the legal system, basically. And time now, so time is also important in that reminds me of the like sort of uh CCRU time war stuff and the emergence of time. I think, um, who talked about that? Um, um in Soci Society the Spectacle by Guy Debord, I think, mentioned not the emergence of time. Uh, as a major turning point in human history. which is sort of an interesting, like, aspect to think about. Of, like, the concept of, like, time and seasons and calendars being, like, something that emerged and changed human, I guess, society. Uh, section C. The Correlation Dikion Alethes. Alethes. Which is... It doesn't say Alethis. The decisive oath the decisive oath is replaced, or at least or at least begins to be replaced by the judgment measure. At the same time, the truth challenge, truth by ordeal, is replaced by truth knowledge. The truth which strikes down or protects, the truth which one knows. One, in fact, for judgment to be just, for crediting to be part of the order of Dikion, and be governed by it, it is necessary, on the one hand, that it take into account that it is based on the exact return of time, the exact measure of things. It's not just a matter of it's not just a matter of remembering the rules, of keeping themis in one's memory. One has to remember seasons and times. One has to have measured the goods. One has to have made this measurement, and one has to remember it. Memory of a different type. In the justice of the oath decision, it was a matter of keeping the rules, customs, and decrees of Zeus in one's memory, and they had to be remembered at the right time in order to apply, in order to apply them on the right occasion. So that so this is an exeget, this is an exegetical memory. In Crinian, a new memory is needed, a memory which has to keep the measure over time so that the return of time restores the same measures. This is an accounting memory which does not have to remember the occasion, but has to preserve the identical writing. Ooh, the emergence of writing. On the one hand, for the sentence, for the sentence to be just, it has to manifest the truth, to say both what must be, how, repar how reparations are to be made, and what is, identical elements, dates which are dates which recur, the return of time. Here again, there is an important transformation. In the decisive oath, a single formulation asserted the truth, carried the day, 
exposed the formulator and marked him out to the good and marked him out to the gods' vengeance. In the judgment measure, we do st we do still have a tight formula which says both what is and what and what must be, but we can see the elements are not the same. The judgment measure no longer indicates the protagonist; it discloses things. The judgment measure imposes a decision. It is a sovereign utterance. Disclosure of the truth and exercise of sovereignty are interdependent and jointly replaced and jointly replace the indication that the indication the agonist in the risk he voluntarily accepts. So we discover three fundamental characteristics of Crinian. So we discover three fundamental characteristics of Crinian. Memory the identical and its made oh. Major, memory the identical and its measure, disclosure the truth, exercise of sovereignty. I'm going to write that down. Three fundamental memory of And of its measure, disclosure of the truth, truth, and exercise of sovereignty. How do you, there you go. We are already in the space in which the Sophists and Plato struggle with each other. Two, but another characteristic is to be noted. This is that Dikion Kai Alethes, which serves as rule for the which serves as rule for the sentence, extends far beyond its location in judicial practice. If the decision of justice is just because it remembers a measure in time, then any then any other speech that remembers them will also just be will also be just speech, just like justice. In any more general way, any action in any person who remembers the measure and time will be just. Two consequences of this: it is no longer any, it is no longer only the king of justice, but every man who has to be just. He will be just in so far as he. Will as he will have paid attention, pricked up his ears, and kept what is just in his memory. Justice is not only what is said, it is what is listened to, and the just man is not only the one who utters the good sentence, he is the man, he is, he is the man, every man who has listened to justice. The punctual debtor, the laborer who does, the laborer who does each thing in its time, the person who knows what to do and what not to do at the right time is someone who, without having to be, without having to hold the staff of sovereignty, is a just man. He should even be the model and norm for and norm for who, yeah, and norm for whoever has to dispense justice. The man is complete who, after reflection, always sees, always sees for himself will be better. What will be best later and and for always? Observe the measure. Appropriateness, appropriateness is a supreme quality in everything. But if, on the other hand, any man may be just when he knows how to listen to the true word of measure and order, conversely, the true cycle of things, the real proportions, the return of the calendar is just as itself, and it is just as itself. In the distribution, in the distribution of things, <clears throat> <clears throat> according to Hesiod, Zeus sees to it that the wealth of harvest exactly rewards men's work, and he even allows them to make up for their, and he even allows them to make up for their forgetfulness. If one has sown too late, one may nevertheless have a good harvest, for Zeus so has, for Zeus has so wished it. And we still find this theme of the just world for a long time, for a long time after, 
in the philosophical poetry or prose of the 6th and 7th centuries. Anaximander, things render justice to each other. Heraclitus, if the sun were to stray from its path, the Irenes would pursue it and the Irenes would, would pursue it and chastise it. Dikion, as it takes shape in the practice of justice, extends far beyond it. It becomes a rule of daily life. It becomes organization of the world. It prescribes what is to be done every day and traces the course of things. We have to listen to it in order to act rightly, but it is what we have but it is what we see when we look at things. We have a relation to it in the form of knowledge. Justice is no longer ordered so much by reference to an asserted and risky truth. Rather, it is linked to the, rather is linked to a truth we know. Being just is no longer merely applying the rules and risking the truth. It is now forgetting to it is now forgetting to know the truth. It is not forgetting the truth we know. Hmm. I'm just going to look at that again. It's not for gain to know the truth. Hmm. This is why Hesiod himself can also deliver a discourse of justice. Certainly, he does not deliver a sentence, but he gives advice. Advice to the kings, advice to kings of justice, advice to a peasant like Persis. He can tell the justness of justice. He can tell the justness of justice. He can pronounce sentences on sentences, opinions on decisions. He can judge the judges. Crinian, suddenly, no doubt the very moment of his birth, acquires a breath in which, se in which sententious poetry, statement of nature, and political demand are not yet distinguished from each other. It is a discourse which has two sides throughout its development, that of justice and that of the, and that of the truth. Right at the start of the poem, Hesiod says to Zeus, May justice rule your decrees. For myself, I shall tell Persis some truths. 3. But a problem arises. What is this truth in the form of knowledge that Crenian needs? On what is it based? Following Hesiod, but also his successors, it is a truth of days and dates, of favorable times, of the movements and conjectures of the stars, of climates, winds, and seasons. That is to say, it is a whole body of cosmological knowledge. It is also the truth of the genesis of the gods in the world, of their order of succession and precedence, of their organization as system of the world. Theogony, theogony, knowledge of the calendar, and of the origin, knowledge of cycles in the beginning, knowledge of cycles and of the beginning. Hmm. Now these two types of knowledge have a well-known histor historio historical and geographical location. They were formed and developed in the great empires of the Euphrates in the Near East, in the Hittite, in the Hittites the Assyrians, and, and in Babylon. And their formation there is linked directly to the form of political power. In fact, one, the structure of the state and the administrative system of these regimes involved keeping rigorously to an official calendar, which indicated the good and bad days for decisions, works, battles, and sowing. Two, they also involved the measure of quantities and a system of equivalences for raising taxes, and at least, services and fees. Finally, three, royal power, as both political and magical religious structure was, on a set date, and in accordance with an identical Indo-European ritual, regularly established by ceremonies, which include the recital of the genealogy, of the exploits of, the, of, the exploits of ancestors, and the king himself. A sort of new beginning on the basis of the beginning, this was the revivifying epic. This was the revivifying. This was the re, this was the revivifying epic of royal power. 
the three great types of knowledge developed by the Assyrians, observational and magical knowledge of days and stars, technical knowledge of quantities and measures, mythical religious knowledge of origins, were linked to the exercise of power in a society in which a state apparatus is relatively developed. They need to have more Assyrian philosophy, like uh, Near East, because you see like lots of Greek philosophy and Roman, and even like I don't know, you know, like Old Testament, uh, I guess Israeli, Hebrew philosophy. I don't know, but it'd be interesting like see like a religious religions of the Near East and the philosophy of the Near East kind of stuff. <clears throat> I'm sure they have like classes on that, but uh, maybe for my own personal note to go check this out, check those out at some point. Now it is to these type. Now it is to these types of knowledge that Dikion, in which Krenian, in which Krenian turn is based, appeals. We know the meaning of this appeal. One demand for a political power, or for an allegon. A, or for an analogon of political power over and above the power exercised by traditional chiefs. <clears throat> Two, assimilation by individuals of all the powers linked to this knowledge. Three, reference beyond the Dorian invasion to earlier structures which, to earlier structures which remained external. But we should note straight away that in the seventh but we should note that but we should note straight away that in the seventh to sixth centuries there really is a return and reappearance of older mythical forms. If writing obliterate the time of the Dorian invasion regain, regain strength, if a whole network of cosmological and magical correspondences are transplanted from the East, this knowledge immediately takes a new form. It is no longer socially located in those who hold political power, exercise it by delegation, or serve as, or serve as its instrument. <clears throat> in Greece, it will no longer be the knowledge of the functionaries, scribes, accountants, and astrologers of power. It will be the knowledge every man needs in order to be just, and to demand justice for all. Knowledge moves from the exercise of power. Knowledge moves from the exercise of power to the control of justice. At the same time, this means it is no longer linked to the secret, or at least tends to be separated from the form or at least tends to be separated from the form of the secret. And following a necessary line, it tends, no less in justice, to be placed in the public arena. Finally, we should note that these three major directions of oriental knowledge are, up to a certain point, what will organize Greek and Western knowledge. One Knowledge of the origin of Genesis and, of Genesis and succession, cosmological, philosophical, and historical knowledge. Two, knowledge of quantities, of accounts and measures, mathematical knowledge, physical knowledge, and three, knowledge of the event, occasion and moment, technical knowledge of agronomy, medicine, magical knowledge. The first two ultimately organize Western science, origin and measurement, succession and quantity, the order of time and numerical order. On the other hand, knowledge of the moment has been gradually marginalized. Stoic logic, magical knowledge, the medical tradition which leads to clinical medicine, which replaces a knowledge of the moment of the medical opportunity with a spatialized of a pathogenic with a spatializ oh with the spatialization of pathogenic seats it is a military political and revolutionary strategy that knowledge of the event moment and opportunity is developed it could be that psycho it could be that psychoanalysis has dot 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 and it just ends uh With it ends with a footnote saying the usual continuation and conclusion of the development of each session is missing.
So I guess they just don't have that ending of the lecture. That's it then. Kind of just ends on an ominous note. Or cliffhanger, really. Huh. Alright. That was actually a pretty short lecture there. Next one's about... Huh. Alright then, I guess I'll be done earlier today. Which is fine with me. <clears throat> because next time we'll be back and we'll be with lecture number eight. How many lectures have we got? Eight, nine... All right. Um, so I guess that's it then for today. Uh, thanks for anybody who makes it th makes it this far. And let me get my mouse out so I can end this. Um, I will see. I will be back Tuesday, hopefully. Probably same time around two o'clock Eastern U.S. time with continuation of the lectures on the world to know more more greeks just endless amounts of greeks so i will say have a nice weekend uh and see you on tuesday bye